Hi, everyone. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, and welcome. Thank you all for joining today's webinar titled Maternal Overweight and Obesity During Pregnancy, Short and Long-Term Risks for the Neonate. My name is Maha Sheikh, and I'm the Communication Specialist for the Jordan Nutrition Innovation Lab. As more attendees are joining the webinar, I will begin by going over some of the logistical items. Next slide, please. I would like to direct all attendees to a few functions on this Zoom call. At the bottom of your screen, you should see a chat icon and a Q&A icon. Please use the chat feature to engage in relevant conversation and introduce yourself to the other attendees. Next, please. If you have a question for our speaker, please use the Q&A feature. We have allotted the final 15 minutes of this webinar for Q&A at which point our speaker will respond to any questions from the audience. This webinar is being recorded and it'll be made available on our website following the event. We will continue to repeat these technical housekeeping items in the chat throughout the webinar as people may be joining in at later times. Next slide, please. I would now like to introduce our moderator for today's webinar, Dr. Lynn Osman. Dr. Lynn Osman is a Saqqar bin Mohammed Al Qasimi Professor in International Nutrition, as well as a professor at the Friedman School of Nutrition, Science, and Policy here at Tufts University. She has been an active investigator in USAID-funded projects in Malawi, Uganda, Nepal, and most recently in Jordan as part of the Jordan Nutrition Innovation Lab. She has been active in experimental studies with humans on lipoprotein response to several vegetable oils, trans fats, and soy protein, in the glycemic response as modified by various meal components. Most recently, she has been examining the molecular mechanism of action of carotenoids against several chronic diseases. Lynn, over to you. Thank you very much and uh, good morning, evening, everybody. Before I introduce our speaker for today, I would like to give a brief introduction to the Jordan Nutrition Innovation Laboratory in our webinar series. The Jordan Nutrition Innovation Lab is a research and capacity building program that is funded by USAID Jordan under Feed the Future initiative. We pursue research and capacity building activities to support the health and nutrition of women of reproductive age, pregnant and lactating women, and infants and young children in Jordan. Some of our key objectives are implementing a rigorous maternal and child nutrition research agenda, including conducting analyses of existing national representative data sets and conducting comprehensive evaluations of programs, such as USAID's community health and nutrition programs. Moreover, we build individual and institutional capacity through the award of fellowships scientific symposia, workshops, and webinars. As part of the capacity building agenda, we recently awarded nine month research grant funds to four competitively selected fellows. With JNIL support, these fellows will conduct their studies and complete publication ready research in the field of maternal and infant young children nutrition. In addition, we conduct these webinars on a regular basis as a means to conduct outreach to a wider group of government officials, academics, stakeholders, and other interested parties. And now I would like to introduce Dr. Patrick Catalano, MD. He is Chair Emeritus, Department of Reproductive Biology at Case Western Reserve University Metro Health Medical Center and he is currently Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the Mother, Infant, and Research Institute of Tufts University School of Medicine. Dr. Catalano's research interests include obesity, diabetes, and metabolism in pregnancy. His research includes the longitudinal evaluation of women before and during and after pregnancy to determine the short and long-term effects of maternal obesity and diabetes on both the mother and her offspring. And now over to Dr. Catalano.
Thank you very much for that kind invitation. And let me get my slides up so we can get started. So what I will be talking about today is the issue related to maternal overweight and obesity during pregnancy and its effects on the fetus in neonate. I don't have any conflicts of financial interest relative to this talk. And here are the objectives of the talk. We'll start with the issue of obesity in mothers and neonates and uh, focus primarily on data that we have here in the United States. As we know, there's been an increasing uh, epidemic of obesity currently in the US. Uh, we have a continued increase in the risk of obesity from the years 2016 through 2020 from approximately 25.5% to 29.5%. Similarly, when we look at the risk of overweight in women who give birth in the United States, it's increased from 25% to 26.7%. So approximately 60% of women having babies in the U.S. are either overweight or obese. Accordingly, the number of women who are normal weight has decreased uh, about four percentage points just in the past four years. When you look at the issues relative to U.S. birth weight, if you just look at the issue of looking at term births, what you see is over a period of years, there's been a decrease in birth weight of about 70 grams. But one has to put this in the context of the gestational age of the neonate at the time of birth. What we do know is that uh, relative to what we had about a decade ago or a decade and a half ago, approximately most of the babies were born at 40 weeks gestation. But over the past decade, we've seen a significant decrease in the mean gestational age of delivery to 39 weeks. And this bottom part of the graph gives you an idea where the decrease has occurred in those births from 41 to 43 weeks, with a significant increase in less than 40 weeks, particularly at 39 weeks. Please keep in mind that even though there's been a 70 gram decrease in birth weight over this period of time, for each week of gestation, the increase in birth weight of a normally grown baby is about 150 grams. So there's been a net increase actually in birth weight of babies here in the US when adjusted for gestational age. How about gestational weight gain? There's been a lot of issues relating to gestational weight gain in women with overweight and obesity during pregnancy. And uh, what I wanna do is to go through some of the issues related to that. These are the Institute of Medicine gestational weight gain guidelines. And what you can see is that there's an inverse relationship between weight gain in being underweight in weight gain, which is decreased for those women who are obese at the time of their conception. What the important point is, is that with increasing maternal pre-pregnancy BMI, there's been a decrease in the recommendation of weight gain because of the accrual of adipose tissue that is already there. The point I want to make though, and I'll go into it a little bit later, is that we don't recommend weight loss in pregnancy, and I'll show you some data why we don't do that. This is data from the Centers for Disease Control looking at weight gain by pre-pregnancy BMI. I want you to focus on the right part of this slide, meaning those women who are either overweight or class one, two, three obesity. And what you can see is that between 45 and 65% of women who are overweight or obese gain excessive weight in pregnancy. Only about 25% of women who are overweight or obese gain appropriate weight gain. And what we see is that those who gain less than the IOM criteria are particularly weighted to those individuals with class three obesity. One question is, what is weight gain in pregnancy? I think what a lot of people don't recognize that the biggest, the largest proportion of weight gain in pregnancy is relating to water, fetal weight, placental weight, amniotic fluid, breast tissue, and finally, maternal blood and extravascular fluid. Please keep in mind that in pregnancy, there's a 40% increase in plasma volume in pregnancy, which accounts for a great proportion of this. So approximately seven to eight kilos of weight gain in pregnancy is represented by water. 
And there's about a one kilo increase in protein related to protein accretion in the fetus, a small amount in the placenta, uh, maternal tissues, uterus and breast, and in maternal blood. There is no extra carbohydrate storage. So glycogen stores in pregnancy are very similar to what you have in the non-pregnant individual. And obviously what the big variable is, is the amount of lipid or fat mass accrual in pregnancy, looking at the literature anywhere between zero and six kilos. And hence the total is approximately nine kilos in weight for those women who are either overweight or obese. We did some research looking at how does gestational weight gain relate to the change in body composition in women evaluated before pregnancy and all the way through late gestation. And what you can see from this slide on the left is that there's a nice linear relationship between gestational weight gain and the change in lean body mass, which again, as a reminder, is primarily water. On the right side of the slide, we break down this weight gain into the categories of the IOM weight gain guidelines for either inadequate on the left, adequate in excess on the right. And what you can see, there's a significant difference between those individuals who are either overweight or obese, having inadequate as compared to excessive weight gain, probably to uh, one or two kilos in uh, difference in weight. When we looked at the fat mass, what well, we see that uh, it is quite linear. The relationship between gestational weight gain and the accrual of fat mass in pregnancy it has an R value of 0.87 and highly significant. Coming over to the right, what you see is again, breaking this down into the IOM categories of inadequate weight gain, where there's a loss of about three kilos of fat mass. Adequate weight gain, again, we're looking at individuals who are either overweight or obese, which is about neutral. And finally, keeping in mind that 40 to 60% of women who have overweight or obesity gain excessive weight gain. What we see is that primarily that increase in weight gain is fat mass and is a mean of about five kilos. Having excessive gestational weight gain in pregnancy is a long-term risk for postpartum weight retention. This is a meta-analysis looking at the changes in gestational weight gain relative to postpartum weight accrual in either one year, nine years, or 15 years. And what you can see is that with excessive weight gain in pregnancy, there's a significant risk for postpartum weight gain retention for about five kilos in weight. So the bottom line in this is, is that 40 to 60% of women with overweight or obesity gain excessive weight in pregnancy. That excessive weight is primarily fat mass. In very few women, probably only 20 to 40% ever come back to their pre-pregnancy weight, and hence a curl of fat mass during a pregnancy is a risk factor for increasing obesity uh, with increasing age. So how does this obesity that we've been talking about affect fetal growth? Our group has elected to look at growth in uh, humans using body composition, looking at either fat mass or lean body mass or fat-free mass. And the reason for this is, is that the human at the time of birth is the mammal with the most amount, with the most amount of body fat, 12 to 18%, depending on the methodology used. Whereas if you look at non-human primates, we're looking at body fat of three to 5% at birth and murine models only two to 3%. So a lot of our data will focus on the issue of looking at growth in babies, looking at their fat mass, as this is a significant component related to long-term risk of obesity. As an obstetrician, we classify babies' weights at the time of birth as small for gestational age, less than 10% of the population, appropriate for gestational age, between 10th and 90th percent of the population, and LGA, that is greater than the 90%. When we looked at the percent body fat in the same population, what we see is that even though um, those babies that we classify as having appropriate weight for gestational age, there's a large overlap with those individual babies who have excessive weight and smaller weight. And hence, using weight as a measure of growth is relatively imprecise 
And there's been a movement to try to look at the amount of fat mass in the baby as a more uh, precise measure of growth and as a risk factor for long-term obesity in childhood and adolescence. This is a study we did years ago, looking at the issue of body composition in neonates of women with gestational diabetes and with normal glucose tolerance, approximately 400 uh, people in total. If we looked at the birth weight of the babies, and these data were adjusted for sex of the baby, gestational age, smoking, et cetera, what we see if all we looked at was birth weight, there was no significant difference in the birth weight of those individuals whose mothers had gestational diabetes as compared to normal glucose tolerance. Similarly, lean body mass was not significantly different. But when we break down the body composition, what we see is that those infants of women with GDM have increased fat mass and percent body fat as compared to the woman with normal glucose tolerance adjusted for significant covariables. If we take this normal glucose tolerant group and break them down into those individuals with a BMI less than 25, normal weight, or those with a BMI greater than 25, overweight or obese, what we see is that the birth weight is about 150 grams heavier in those individuals whose uh, mothers had a BMI greater than 25. Because of the small numbers, it didn't reach significance, but it's about 150 gram increase, which is consistent with the epidemiology. Lean body mass was about the same, but similar to what we saw in those individuals with gestational diabetes, the infants of the mothers with normal glucose tolerance who had a BMI greater than 25 has significantly greater fat mass and percent body fat as compared to those mothers who had normal glucose tolerance. Interestingly, what we see, it was not related to excessive weight gain. And point of fact is that those individuals with a BMI greater than 25 gain less weight as compared to those individuals with a BMI less than 25. One point I want to mention is that at the time that these studies were done, approximately 5 to 10% of people had a diagnosis of gestational diabetes. But as we saw in one of the earlier slides, currently 50 to 60% of individuals who are pregnant have a pre-pregnancy BMI of uh, greater than 25, either overweight or obese. And if looking at their fat mass, it is very similar to what we see in those individuals with gestational diabetes, yet we offer, in many cases, no additional treatment for those individuals who come into pregnancy with a BMI greater than 25. And when we did a stepwise regression analysis, looking at what are the factors related to fat mass in the offspring, what we see is that contrary to our hypothesis, where we thought that those individuals with GDM would account for most of the fat mass in the individuals. It actually turned out to be the pre-pregnancy BMI, and it was the same as we looked at the percent body fat. So even in a population that had 50% women with gestational diabetes, the factor that was most strongly correlated to adiposity in the offspring was the mother's pre-pregnancy BMI. So there's been a movement to try and decrease gestational weight gain in pregnancy as a potential way to uh, avoid some of these issues related to long-term obesity in the offspring. So what I want to do is to go through some of those studies in general and uh, show you what the data has come up with. This was the LIMIT study done a few years ago in uh, Australia and basically was a lifestyle intervention of healthy eating and exercise. And the conclusion of the study was for those women who are overweight or obese, antenatal lifestyle advice used in this study did not reduce the risk of delivering a baby weighing above the 90th centile for gestational age in sex, this is LGAs, or improve maternal pregnancy and birth outcomes. Similarly, this is the upbeat uh, study done by Lucilla Poston in the UK. Similarly, a behavioral intervention in obese women showing a behavioral intervention addressing diet and physical activity in women with obesity during pregnancy is not adequate to prevent gestational diabetes or reduce the incidence of a large for gestational age baby. And very similarly, the fit for delivery Norwegian study showed that intervention 
uh, in pregnancy had no measurable effect on obstetrical or neonatal outcomes, despite a modest but significant decrease in gestational weight gain. The last slide I want to go over, the last study I want to go over relating to this issue was published in the BMJ, and it was a meta-analysis of looking at the effect of diet and physical activity-based intervention in pregnancy and gestational weight gain and using individual patient data from randomized trials. This is uh, the summary slide looking at what is the effect of diet and physical activity interventions on gestational weight gain. Individual patient data is here, over 9,000 individuals, and the number of women in uh, both individual patient data and non-individual patient data is over 17,000. I would like you to focus here on the right side of the slide, and in red, you'll see those uh, outcomes that were significant. Overall, a lifestyle intervention in pregnancy in this meta-analysis resulted in a decrease in a, a weight gain in the intervention group of 0.7 kilos. It was significant. Diet didn't seem to be a significant variable, contrary to most of the individual studies, whereas physical activity seemed to be uh, having an effect, uh, with, which was significant, and mixed, including both methods, wasn't significant. What is the effect of diet and physical activity on neonatal outcomes? Unfortunately, none of the outcomes, whether it was a composite, the risk of stillbirth, small for gestational age, large for gestational age, or admission to a neonatal, neonatal intensive care unit were significant. When you're looking at the same data relating to maternal outcomes, the only significant factor that this lifestyle intervention affected was not a composite, not gestational diabetes, not hypertension, not preterm birth, but a slight decrease, a 9% decrease in the risk of a cesarean delivery. So when these studies were published, a lot of the discussion was, well, we really didn't get that much of a change in gestational weight, we need to push it a little bit harder. And as a result, we looked at a study that was part of the Maternal Fetal Medicine Network study on gestational diabetes, looking at what is the impact of inadequate gestational weight gain on fetal growth. And we published this a few years ago in the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology. So here are the maternal characteristics. We looked at those individuals in the MFMU GDM study who gained greater than five kilos, over a thousand women, and those individuals who gained less than five kilos. And here are the maternal characteristics. No significant difference in age or pre-pregnancy height, but pre-pregnancy weight was significantly higher in those individuals who gained less than five kilos. And similarly, the BMI was significantly higher in those individuals who gained less than five kilos, 34 versus 30. And as you break it down into the groups, what you can see, it's all related to those individuals who are either overweight or obese, here and here, no difference in tobacco use and no difference in parity. When you look at... Um, the ethnicity, there was no difference in the ethnic groups and those who gained greater than five and less than five kilos. The glucose status was significantly different, slightly less in those women with the normal glucose challenge test, uh, slightly less in those individuals with an abnormal glucose challenge test, but a normal glucose tolerance test. But what we see is when we looked at those women who were in this randomized controlled trial who had gestational diabetes treated, there were significantly more women who gained less than five kilos in the treated group as compared to the uh, those who gained greater than five kilos. And those women who were untreated, showing there was no significant difference. And the mean weight gain in those who gained less than five kilos was 1.1 kilos, significantly less in 14.4 kilos in those who gained greater than five kilos. The last slide in this section is looking at issues related to the neonate. What is the effect of gaining less weight in pregnancy as compared to greater than five kilos? And we use five kilos as our outcome measure based on the IOM guidelines for those individuals with obesity uh, before pregnancy. There was no difference in gestational age, no difference in gender, 
Birth weight was significantly less in those women who gained less than five kilos. But this study used an estimate of body composition to look at this in a more detailed manner. Length was significantly less in those individuals who gained less than uh, five kilos. Head circumference was significantly less. Lean mass was significantly less by about 170 grams and fat mass was significantly less by about 70 grams. Percent body fat was significantly less in the, those individuals gaining less than five kilos. There was a decrease in SGA, but the cost of that was a significant increase in the number of SGA babies born at that time. So in essence, inadequate gestation weight gain, yes, is associated with the decrease in birth weight, but breaking it down into the components, what we see not only is there a decrease in fat mass, but there's a decrease in lean body mass, which may be significant relating to length, head circumference, and, fat, and an increase in SGA. These may increase the risk of problems such as stunting that uh, are a particular problem in adults relative to metabolic dysfunction in later life. So let's spend the last couple of minutes talking about uh, does this maternal obesity, certainly relating to issues to neonatal growth, how does it affect the risk of childhood obesity? And for this study, we're going to be talking about the HAPO study. HAPO stands for the Hyperglycemia and Adverse Pregnancy Outcome Study that was done not only here in the U.S., but in countries around the world, in Europe, the Middle East, um, Asia, and um, actually the Caribbean as well. And it was a study that looked at what are the criteria for the diagnosis of gestational diabetes. This was an observational study where no one was treated, so please keep this in mind. And the diagnosis of gestational diabetes used in these outcome measures was uh, the IADPSG or WHO criteria that we're currently using. If we look at overweight or obesity or obesity as a categorical outcome, let me take you through the modeling of the uh, risk, meaning what is the risk if a woman had gestational diabetes and now we're looking at the follow-up of her offspring at age eight to 12. And the data were adjusted in model one for field center, which was a proxy for ethnicity, age, and sex. And model two was adjusting for the child's pubertal status at the time of the follow-up. Model three was looking at variables during pregnancy, excluding BMI, for example, hypertensive issues, if the participant was smoking. And final model four included everything in models one, two, and three, plus the BMI in pregnancy. So the question is, if a woman had gestational diabetes using the WHO criteria and not treated, what was the risk of her offspring at age eight to 11 being overweight or obese? Going down through the modeling, what you can see was that it was a significant relationship between GDM in the mother and offspring overweight and obesity. It wasn't very attenuated in model two, a slight attenuation in model three, but when we adjust for the mother's BMI during pregnancy, we no longer reach significance. The P was 0.052. If we just look at obesity as an outcome measure based on BMI, which is 95% uh, confidence intervals, what we see similarly is that in model one and model two, there's not much of a difference. There's a two-fold increase. Model three with variables in pregnancy decreases to 1.8. And finally, what we see is that adjusting for BMI attenuates the relationship to 1.58. It still remains significant, but highly attenuated. And again, this is looking at obesity as a categorical variable. And finally, looking at BMI as a continuous variable, what we see similar to uh, the first section of this slide is that models one, two, and three show a slight attenuation. But once you adjust, uh, adjust for maternal BMI during pregnancy, the relationship between GDM and uh, increased BMI in the offspring gets attenuated, and it's no longer significant, the p-value 0.11. In this study, we also looked at body composition. 
And in the blue box, you can see the relationship between um, the percent body fat as a categorical variable greater than the 85th centile. The modeling is the same as we talked about previously. And what you can see is that the relationship between having GDM in pregnancy and having an offspring with a body fat greater than the 85th percentile was higher in uh, those in model one, model two, slightly attenuated in model three, and more uh, attenuated in model four, but still remains significant. And finally, we look at bod pod percent body fat, and this was the methodology we used. The percent body fat is a continuous measure, highly significant in model one and two, slightly attenuated in model three, and significant attenuation, though still significant in model four. The last couple of slides, we're going to be looking at the issue is what is the association of maternal BMI with childhood body composition? If we take a look at this slide, this represents the reference group, those women who had normal BMI in pregnancy. Here are those individuals in pregnancy who were underweight, overweight, and obese. The original HAPO study had 25,000 uh, members in it, and the follow-up study includes over 5,000 women from various parts of the world. If a woman was overweight in pregnancy, this particular area here, she had an increase in, in weight of her offspring of close to four kilos. 1.6 kilos was lean body mass and 2.3 kilos were related to fat mass. When we look at the right side of the curve, if a mother was obese during the pregnancy, what we see is that her child at age eight to 12 had an increase in weight of 9.3 kilos, 3.7 of which were lean mass and 5.6 kilos, which were fat mass. Taking the same data and now including those women who had a diagnosis of gestational diabetes, and for reference, let's look at those women who were obese, the change in weight related to the mother's uh, obesity was 9.3 kilos in the offspring, but only 0.91 kilos uh, when you uh, adjust for gestational diabetes. So significantly more of the variance was related to maternal obesity, lean mass, the same thing, and significantly more also in the fat mass. So basically our summary is, is that in pregnancy with increased insulin resistance, whether we're talking about obesity or GDM, mediated by metabolic inflammation, there's an increase in fetal and neonatal metabolic program of obesity, childhood obesity, and adult metabolic syndrome, we think is the last part of this graph leading to this vicious cycle. The way that we're approaching this issue in a research study we're doing, knowing that interventions during pregnancy haven't been successful, planned pregnancies is the key. We screen for those issues related to hypertension, diabetes, and dyslipidemia that should be treated before pregnancy. Optimizing weight. And optimizing weight isn't getting a BMI from 35 to 25, but improving it by 5% has shown to have significant metabolic improvement. Diet is important relative to micronutrients, vitamins, and supplements, and the diet that we're using in our study is a Mediterranean-type diet. Regular exercise started before pregnancy is important, and the issue we want to make sure is that it's a transdisciplinary, multi-specialty strategy. So the take-home messages are that overweight obesity affects 60% of reproductive-age women, 45 to 65 percent of women with overweight or obesity gain excessive weight gain, and only 20 to 40 percent return to the pre-pregnancy weight. Overweight and obesity in pregnancy is a risk factor for increased fetal adiposity. Lifestyle interventions during pregnancy have a modest effect on decreasing excessive gestational weight gain, but a minimal effect on fetal growth. Inadequate gestational weight gain, less than five kilos, is associated with an increased risk of SGA, and maternal obesity in pregnancy is associated with higher childhood obesity. So let me stop there and see if there are any questions, and thank you for your attention. All right, now is the time for um, people to ask questions and we already have several in the chat. Okay, 
Dr. Catalano, here's a question from Tuga. How can we assess the fat mass in a newborn? Well, there are many ways to do it, and not all of them are exceedingly expensive. Uh, so that's important. The methodology we use in our research studies is a device called uh, air plethysmography. Basically, we estimate the then uh, the the uh, volume of a baby by displacing air, knowing the weight of the baby. We get the weight per unit volume, which is density, and then can back calculate. But what we've done is that in order to make this more useful, we have a methodology called skinfold measures. All we need is the length of the baby, the weight of the baby, and one skinfold measure, and it correlates very well with these expensive pieces of machinery. And so many studies in the U.S. are using this as an outcome measure uh, now uh, of looking at adiposity. Weight on a scale, length on a measuring board, and getting a skinfold caliper and measuring one skinfold. The data is published and it's been uh, validated against uh, more sophisticated methods. And um, maybe afterwards I can give you the reference if someone's really interested. That's great. You mentioned um, length on a board or a length of the baby. There's always a lot of variation in that depending on who has trained a person. Have you? How have you figured out to make sure that that's an accurate measure? What we do actually is we do training, just like you said. We actually, instead of using a tape measure against the squiggly baby at the time of birth, we actually measure the baby on a measuring board. And part of the current NIH study that we have Every six months, I get a video of people doing these measurements and rate them on their measurements and give them some feedback so that the measures are reproducible. But a measuring board is the key to it. Oh, wow. Okay, thank you. All right, a question from Hala. Uh, do microbiota play a role in inducing gestational diabetes? The answer is, I don't know the answer to that question. It probably does, and we know that the microbiota changes in pregnancy. Whether there's a significant difference in those individuals with gestational diabetes or not, I don't think we quite know the answer yet. The only thing I would say is that when we look at the metabolic factors uh, relating to gestational diabetes, they exist pre-pregnancy. Pregnancy has a relatively uniform effect on the changes in insulin sensitivity and some of these other measures that we see. And so my guess is that um, the microbiota does have an effect. How much of an effect, I don't know. And there's been some studies uh, looking at this, and um, but I can't really comment on it with any real knowledge. Right. Thank you. Another question does genetic predisposition play a role in gestational diabetes? It does. I think that what we do know is that that HAPO follow-up study I, I talked about, when we looked at the metabolic issues in the offspring, if the mother had gestational diabetes, which is related to insulin, decreased insulin sensitivity and poor beta cell response, when we looked at the offspring, we see a similar picture. And this was independent of obesity of the offspring. So yes, there is definitely a genetic component to it, but it's probably also uh, affected by environmental factors, your diet, your physical activity, and so forth. Okay, thank you. Does gestational diabetes, is it now considered a risk factor for autism disorder among offspring? Yeah, I think that, that there is a fair amount of literature on this, and the person who's written a lot about it is a woman by the name of Annie Zhang at Kaiser at University of, in Southern California. She used to be at USC, and she's done a lot of epidemiology looking at this issue. So there does seem to be an association between gestational diabetes or hyperglycemia or neurocognitive issues in the offspring, specifically uh, autism spectral disorders. And I would refer someone to look at her data since uh, she's kind of the expert in this area. All right, thank you. From Rima, is there a difference in the birth outcomes, maternal and fetal, depending on the time of increase in gestational waking per pregnancy trimester, that is the first, second, and third? Does it matter when you gain your weight? Yeah. Um... 
my personal opinion is no, but the literature would seem to say that there is. So I will quote the literature in saying that uh, many people have looked at weight gain in early pregnancy as a risk factor for the development of gestational diabetes and even for excessive fetal growth. Why that is, I don't think anyone has a mechanism. It's just an observation that seems to be related uh, to this outcome. But keep in mind that when what really is going on in early pregnancy, first trimester, is from a maternal point of view, increasing plasma volume relative to cardiovascular function. And actually then what we're looking at the fetal placental unit, you're looking at uh, placental growth and placental gene expression. So that's probably more the issue right there is that what are the issues related to placental function that only become clinically manifest in third trimester? Thank you. Another question. Did the trimester of pregnancy influence the effect of the diet physical activity um, on weight gain during pregnancy? I think most of the literature would say that the earlier in pregnancy one begins this, and ideally before pregnancy, can help mitigate some of these issues related to excessive weight gain. What we do know is that if people, for the sake of discussion, are involved in an exercise program in early pregnancy, but don't continue it into the third trimester, which can be difficult because of all the physiological changes, what we see is that the babies tend to be bigger. So uh, what we generally recommend is what the American College of OBGYN recommends is to not start a new exercise program when you're pregnant, but start it before pregnancy and continue with that level of activity during pregnancy because you're more likely to maintain it rather than decrease it later in gestation. Okay, now I have a question from somebody who wonders is the weight gain during pregnancy changeable? That is, can it change with time? I mean, nowadays lifestyle totally is totally different from 20 to 25 years ago. So we all stick to the old rules of weight gain. Well, the rules for the weight gain were the IOM guidelines. And I'll have to just say I was part of that committee. So I'm a little bit attached to them. And the one thing about the IOM guidelines, a lot of people have criticism and it's true is that at the time that they were formulated, we didn't have data on obesity class two and three. So what we did is that the guidelines for weight gain for obesity were applied to uh, obesity classes one, two, and three. And we realized that was uh, a limitation of the guidelines, but that's all we had at that time. And I think that um, what we see now is that if people are pushing waking, most of the waking studies haven't showed much of a difference. I think it's fair to say that if you have a lifestyle intervention in pregnancy, maybe you can affect one to two kilos of weight gain. And um, I think the point is, is that if you are healthy before you get pregnant, which is one of our goals, using that either the pre-pregnancy uh, time period or for those women who just had a baby, the postpartum period, that's the time to try and really affect weight gain so that you begin the next pregnancy in better metabolic health than you did the year last, at least to get back to your pre-pregnancy weight, which uh, for many women is quite difficult. All right, thank you. Here's a question from somebody for women who have overweight or obesity. And I think you showed there's a risk both for excessive uh, gestational weight gain and uh, a decrease in gestational weight gain. And are we able to predict the direction of the weight gain? Are there risk factors that have been identified so we know which category somebody might fall in? No, but that's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. And it just seems that uh, why those individuals who are class two and three of uh, obesity gain uh, less weight. What we did see is that one of the uh, slides I showed is that they were treated for gestational diabetes. And sometimes uh, they can be, uh, if someone is obese, does develop gestational diabetes, there seems to be an excessive uh, adherence to diet and people kind of go over 
the edge a little bit so that they actually start losing weight. One of the criteria that we've been trying to push is that eating healthy is really the key. We don't give people a diet when they're pregnant. We give them nutritional guidelines to eat healthy. And I think that's the point I really want to make. And, you know, not to throw a plug in, but what the diet that we're using is a Mediterranean diet, a diet that's deep, low in simple sugars, low in saturated fat, high complex carbohydrates, and, you know, less red meat, increased vegetables, and so forth. And we think that type of a balanced diet is important. And I would be less concerned about weight gain if you're eating healthy. That seems to be more of the, more of the concern. Okay. Somebody asked, some literature use the percentage adequacy instead of total gestational weight gain. Which one do you think is more precise? I guess it depends on what's the percentage that people were looking at, a percent of the pre-pregnancy weight or something like that. So I, I would think that there's a, you need to gain a certain amount of weight in pregnancy, even if you're overweight and obese. And the point I wanted to make with one of those slides is a lot of the increase in weight, regardless of your pre-pregnancy weight, is how much water you uh, accrue in pregnancy. If you don't accrue that six, five to seven kilos of water, you're going to have an increased risk of problems. So I would say the minimal amount of weight gain is five kilos. And the other thing you could do is look at the growth of the baby using ultrasound and things of this nature. So a lot of people in treating gestational diabetes, looking at the baby as kind of a clinical biomarker. If someone's glucose values are minimally elevated, yet the baby seems to be growing appropriately, a lot of people don't institute a lot of treatment. Whereas on the other hand, if, if someone is very overweight or obese and not gaining much weight, and the glucoses are elevated in the baby's excessive size, then you may see people starting to use insulin in those categories. So what I would think is that you need to modify that, not just on the growth of the mother or the weight of the mother, but also looking at the projection of the growth of the fetus. So in some cases you may do more, some cases you may do less, particularly in women with gestational diabetes. Okay. New question. Is there a way to estimate pre-pregnancy weight for those who start A and C late? I'm not sure what that is and are not aware of their weight before conception. Can MUAC be used as a proxy? I think A and C is antenatal uh, care. Let, oh, care. I, I, guess. I guess the AN, but okay. So what I would say is that um, with medical records now electronic, at least here in the U.S., we do have pre-pregnancy weight. But weight gain in the first trimester really only averages one to two kilos. So in those situations where someone comes in for antenatal care, I think you can very easily use the weight at the first visit as long as it's in the first trimester. Okay. Uh, Shata Haymour, clinical dietitian from Jordan, is asking, is the risk of maternal obesity higher among IVF pregnancies? I th the answer is, I don't know that issue, but I think that there's an issue independent of obesity related to IVF pregnancies. IVF pregnancies have been associated with some adverse perinatal outcomes, and I would assume that obesity would be another risk factor that might be additive, but that's only a conjecture. I don't have any data to say one way or the other. Okay. Uh, question here, what intervention uh, will be able to mitigate the risk? And I don't know if this is a maternal or fetal. Well, I think that in this case, in pregnancy, you, you're treating both at the same time. So um, again, ideally, if a person is overweight or obese to try and improve their metabolic condition before they get pregnant is to decrease their weight by 5%. And that has shown to improve issues related to insulin sensitivity, inflammatory response, and so forth. 
I think beginning an exercise program is important. It doesn't have to be uh, in a gym or with a trainer, but it can be as simple as walking on a regular basis. And I think the last thing is eating healthy would be the third component to it. So um, those are the things that I think that everyone can do, realizing that food insecurity is an issue here in the U.S. in many populations. And I assume that it would be uh, related to different populations around the world as well. But avoiding simple sugar seems to be one of the issues because of the stimulatory effect on pancreatic beta cell function, which can then um, really um, cause havoc relative to uh, increasing risk of obesity by inhibiting lipolysis. Right, here's a, an, an interesting question. What can you do for the obese infant before reaching one year old in order to control the rapid weight gain later in life? Another very interesting question, I agree. I think based on the developmental origins of health and disease, the concept is it's the first thousand days, including the 280 days of pregnancy. So usually from conception through two years of age will be those periods of time when one can program uh, uh, the offspring to improve long-term health. Issues I think are relating to one, breastfeeding. We know that breastfeeding can uh, certainly be of beneficial health to the mother relative to the risk of obesity in the offspring. I think that the data is less clear. Uh, some people would say, yes, uh, breastfeeding can decrease that risk of obesity long-term. And others, uh, there have been some uh, randomized controlled trials show that there is no difference in obesity looking at some of these cluster effects. One of the things that uh, one of our colleagues is looking at, her name is Dr. Remy Sand, she's over at the Brigham. What we're looking at is in those women in a lifestyle intervention postpartum of healthy eating and exercise, what we see it affects their breast milk composition. And by affecting the breast milk composition, that may have some long-term effects. Helpful. So I would think that a simple thing is that we encourage all women to breastfeed. How healthy it is for the baby, we don't know. But postpartum or through the pregnancy, by eating healthy and exercising when you're breastfeeding, we know it doesn't affect breast milk production. Babies still grow appropriately, and it may alter the macronutrient content so that it may have some beneficial effects later on in childhood and adolescence. But we're only starting to look at it really in infancy. Okay, thank you. Is there an association between gestational diabetes and kidney failure later in babies? Not that I know of. I think that you can say that gestational diabetes is associated with metabolic dysfunction. And the metabolic dysfunction that a lot of people here in the U.S. have been looking at are cardiovascular disorders. So that if gestational diabetes is associated with metabolic dysfunction, the metabolic syndrome in the offspring, which I think the HAPO follow-up study seems to indicate some factors, we were looking more at insulin sensitivity and resistance, then if the cardiovascular risk factors are there, then I would think that uh, kidney function could be a sequelae of some of those. All right. Um, are there specific guidelines in parenthesis ACOG for mothers to follow before getting pregnant to help them start pregnancy with the right weight for pregnancy? Yeah, I, I think the ACOG has been recommending healthy eating, exercise, and trying to decrease pre-pregnancy BMI. Again, how much? It depends on the individual, but the studies that are out there say about a 5% decrease in weight for those individuals who are overweight or obese may be particularly helpful to improve metabolic function. So there is that healthy eating, and there are guidelines that the American College of OBGYN has published for those individuals planning a pregnancy. The issue is, is that at least in this country, approximately half or a little less than half of all pregnancies uh, are not planned. And as a result of that, um, one needs to look at this as a life course event starting from birth through childhood, 
and uh, health care of the individual, even as the uh, prepubertal individual. So start early and start often, I guess, would be the, the recommendation to follow these lifestyle recommendations. Okay. Um, now, as we kind of end our thing here, I have a big question uh, that I would like you to address. From the policy standpoint, every country, uh, none of us have millions of dollars, and we have to figure out where to put our efforts. So if we're trying to have healthier mothers and healthier babies, uh, where do you think we put our, we can't do everything all at once. So where do you think we should put our efforts? Well, I'll give you my bias and their only bias is the personal opinion. I think prevention is really the key. The issue with prevention, if you don't see the results for decades to come, but as we see the risk of obesity continuing to climb, as I showed in one of the early slides, in the US, almost 60% of women having a baby are either overweight or obese. And we know that um, issues that are happening now, for example, there's, there's been a run on the medications, Ozempic uh, and so forth to lose weight. But those studies that, and there's only a few of them who've looked at these, what we see is that people who try to lose weight before they get pregnant, other than using lifestyle, using medication, a keto diet, what have you, as soon as they stop the diet, they rebound back up and they gain more weight again. So I think that if I it was a public policy person, I think we need to get the governments involved, the food industry involved, to looking at getting people healthy before they get pregnant. Even one issue that we run into that in our studies that we've done is that we're looking at women who've already had a baby. So they're coming to us after their first pregnancy. And here in the U.S., the time you have off for your prenatal care is very short. And um, what we've done is that the pandemic actually helped us, that where people were sequestered, we were able to work with them via Zoom, via FaceTime, and have them work out on their own with healthy eating and uh, exercise. Again, I realize that healthy eating is not cheap, but it is beneficial and how we can best do that is really a public policy issue. Our studies are proof of principle. No one's gonna be able to do these things that we're looking at these mechanisms. But I think if you can have people either before pregnancy ideally, or if nothing else after a pregnancy, work on their own health, work on breastfeeding the baby, getting into a lifestyle, which if you have the time, and again, if the uh, amount of time that a woman has postpartum can be extended here in the US, effort can be made to improve your health during that time period that may have real benefits 10, 20 years down the line. If nothing else, it does no harm. Eating healthy, exercising is really what we think the key is. What's the best diet? You know, you can talk about a DASH diet, you can talk about a Mediterranean diet, but we know the things that aren't good. Saturated fats and simple sugars, um, you know, uh, fructose and corn syrup and things like that. So I would think that if I if I could change public policy here, this is what I would do. I would certainly, as an obstetrician, extend the postpartum time period for women to have off to put effort into their uh, their baby relative to breastfeeding and putting effort into their own health through uh, continuing to eat healthy and exercise so that if indeed they want to have a, another child, they begin that pregnancy less obese, less in metabolic dysfunction, and hopefully healthier. And we think it will have long-term benefits for the offspring. Well, thank you very much for being with us. And I'm very happy the audience had some really excellent questions. Agreed. Um, is, there, uh, is there anything else you'd like to say before we wrap this up? No, I think my last uh, issue about, you know, public policy and getting the governments to look at pregnant women as the future uh, of where we are and to start working on this issue now rather than dealing with the, all of the metabolic dysfunctions in later life of atherosclerotic disease, hypertension, diabetes, and so forth. Now's the time to work on it. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Catalano.
And well, thank um, you. I guess that's it.